And if I open up plug, you'll see the distinctive black smoke of burning a set. Oh boy. Woo! Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi and I'm back. I've been on a three-week vacation to the Washington DC area, which was excellent. I got to see a lot of very interesting museums and historical sites, and I even brought back a bunch of really interesting goodies to show you on this channel. None more awesome than this. This is called a Big Bang Cannon, and this is a type of toy that's been in near continuous production since the 1910s and functions on the basis of a chemical reaction that we've actually covered before on this channel. So without further ado, let's dive right in and find out what this is and how it works. So the story of the Big Bang Cannon begins in 1907 with one William Franklin, assistant professor of physics at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Now, Franklin was very concerned by the disturbingly high rate of fireworks related injuries in the United States, especially around the 4th of July. And so he set out to produce a toy that would produce a suitably big bang but do so safely. And in 1907, he patented a toy cannon that worked by burning acetylene gas produced by the reaction between calcium carbide and water. Now, as I covered in my previous video on carbide lamps, link in the description, calcium carbide was discovered by accident in 1892 by Canadian inventor Thomas Wilson. Now, Wilson was originally looking for an economical means of producing aluminum. And he thought that the answer lay in the newly developed technology of carbon arc electric furnaces. So he first tried reducing aluminum ore directly in the furnace, but when this didn't work, he decided to switch tactics and instead smelt a more chemically reactive metal, namely calcium, which he then hoped could be used to reduce the aluminum ore. So to this end, he mixed together calcium oxide, aka lime, and coal tar and put them in the furnace. But what came out wasn't pure calcium, but rather a hard gray substance, which Wilson identified as calcium carbide. He then discovered that if you drop calcium carbide into water, it reacts to produce acetylene gas, which burns with a bright white flame. And this discovery made Wilson a millionaire, since acetylene soon found multiple applications in industrial chemistry, in welding, and in lighting. And calcium carbide and acetylene weren't just used in small carbide lamps like this one, which are used by coal miners and as headlamps on bicycles and early automobiles, but also in lighthouses and in home lighting systems, where the calcium carbide and water were reacted in a separate gas generator and the resulting acetylene piped into the house and burned in regular gas light fixtures. And these systems were very popular in rural households not connected to the municipal gas system, because it was much easier to transport and deliver solid calcium carbide, much as you would coal, as opposed to compressed acetylene gas. Now, going back to William Franklin, his decision to power his toy cannon with acetylene was a very clever one for a number of reasons. Number one, calcium carbide was widely available at the time, so these cannons were very cheap for children to operate. And number two, Acetylene gas has one of the broadest explosive limits of any gas, meaning that it will form an explosive mixture with air over a wide range of concentrations, specifically 2.5% to 82%. So this gives these cannons a very broad margin of error. You really don't need to worry about getting the gas mixture exactly right. The cannon will go off pretty much no matter what you do. But more important from a safety standpoint, at regular atmospheric pressure and temperature, oxyacetylene has a very low energy density, meaning that it can't generate a very high chamber pressure. And indeed, the very first Big Bang cannons were actually made out of glass in order to demonstrate their inherent safety, while later models like this one were made of cast iron and thin sheet steel, which can't withstand a more powerful explosion such as from a gunpowder charge. Furthermore, adding more carbide and thus more gas to the chamber doesn't increase the power of the explosion, just the opposite in fact, since you are displacing a lot of the oxygen needed to sustain combustion. And finally, calcium carbide itself is fairly inert. You can't set it off by hitting it with a hammer, grinding it, lighting it with matches, or anything else a young child might try to do. And so this combines to create a very reliable and very safe toy. Now, as I mentioned before, Franklin patented his original design in 1907. Well, in 1912, a fellow professor of physics at Lehigh University, one James Wiley, founded the Gas Cannon Company in order to produce his design commercially. Now, 
Franklin's original patented design was rather complex, with the barrel and combustion chamber being mounted on top of a separate gas generator. And how this was supposed to work was that you would fill the bottom of the gas generator with water and you would drop chunks of calcium carbide down a chute running through the middle. And there was a domed protrusion at the bottom of the chamber to deflect the chunks of calcium carbide to the periphery so that the acetylene produced would not escape up the chute. Now, the top of the gas generator telescoped into the bottom such that as acetylene gas accumulated, the weight of the top section would keep it under pressure, very much like the gasometers used in municipal gas systems. And once enough acetylene had accumulated, the operator would press a spring-loaded valve to release a small charge of acetylene through a short rubber hose into the combustion chamber on the cannon, where it could then be ignited. And ignition was accomplished using an electrical system comprising a battery connected to an induction coil and a sliding spring-loaded bolt running through the combustion chamber. So what you would do is pull on a lanyard and this would close and immediately open the circuit, causing the induction coil to discharge and a spark to jump across the gap, igniting the gas and setting off an explosion. But while all of this worked in principle, it was far too complex and expensive to produce commercially. So in 1915, James Wiley patented a simplified design that eliminated the separate gas generator and moved that function to the combustion chamber. So in this design, the bottom of the combustion chamber had a sump into which you would pour the water, and the rear of the combustion chamber was closed by a breech plug to which was attached a small metal spoon. So what you would do is you would scoop out a small amount of calcium carbide into the spoon and screw the breech block back in, whereupon that calcium carbide would fall out of the spoon into the water sump and produce acetylene gas. You would then ignite this gas mixture using a small ferrocerium spark wheel at the back of the breech plug. And interestingly enough, Wiley maintained that he had designed this system specifically for use in Big Bang cannons and that the Ronson company had stolen it for use in their cigarette lighters, though nobody has been able to confirm this. Then in 1924, the gas cannon company, now renamed the Toy Cannon Works, introduced its trademark plunger style spark plug, which used a linear striker for the ferrocerium flint as opposed to a round one. And the design of Big Bang cannons would remain stable for around another decade until 1935, when Wiley patented the auto-charging hopper, which allows you to dispense multiple charges of calcium carbide into the cannon more easily. And this is the configuration that we have here, so let's have a closer look at this particular cannon and see how it works. Right, so this is the 16-inch 10FC Junior Field model, first introduced in 1935 and still manufactured by the Conestoga Company, the current iteration of the Gas Cannon Company. So Conestoga also makes a 25-inch long version called the Major Field model, but otherwise it is identical in design and operation. So as you can see, the combustion chamber and the wheels are made of cast iron, the trail, the shield, and the barrel out of light stamped sheet metal, and we even have some wooden bushings on the axle, so a very well-built and robust little toy. Now, originally, these would have been painted a pale tan color. This was changed to olive drab in the 1960s, and then finally to black in the mid-1980s, though the wheels were always red. So as this one is painted black, this is no more than 40 years old. Right, so how this works is that the bottom of the combustion chamber, which doubles as the trunnion, is hollow, and this serves as our water sump. So you would fill that by unscrewing the charger and pouring in water. You would then open the lid on the charger hopper and fill it with calcium carbide. Now, since achieving reliable results depended on getting a consistent mix of calcium carbide and water, Conestoga sold a proprietary blend of calcium carbide called Bangsite, which had a grain size of around one millimeter in diameter. And this was sold in one and three quarter ounce or 50 gram tubes, which was about enough for 100 shots. So looking inside the hopper, you can see this little spring attached to this brass plunger. And if I push this out, you can see that there's a little cutout which meters out a small charge of bangsite into the combustion chamber. And if we look on the lid, we can see that this is marked Conestoga Company, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And this is interesting because along with the color of the barrel, this dates this particular example to between 1985 and 1986, because in 1986, production at Bethlehem ceased and was moved to a new factory in Allentown. Right, so moving back, we have our breech plug, 
with our linear spark plug. So as you can see, this is just a linear plunger with a toothed edge that engages a ferrocerium flint held inside this tube. And behind it is a little spring and a screw for adjusting the tension. And to use this, you simply push on the plunger and like a cigarette lighter, it produces a spark. Now, an interesting little detail on this breech plug is the little metal spoon, which on earlier versions of Big Bang cannons, which loaded from the rear, was used to load the calcium carbide into the chamber. Now, this serves no purpose on this configuration of Big Bang cannons, since we have our auto load hopper here, but Conestoga still produces the old style cannons, and this spoon really doesn't interfere with the operation of this design. So rather than changing their production line to produce two different versions of the breech plug, one with the spoon or one without, they instead went with one universal design. Right, so now the moment you've all been waiting for, let's actually try and set off this Big Bang cannon. Now, one of the many safety features of this design is that the report, the bang produced by the cannon, measures in at between 105 and 120 decibels, just under the 130 decibel limit for permanent hearing loss. However, that's assuming that you're setting this off outside, whereas I am in a very small studio here, so I'm going to put in some earplugs, as well as safety goggles. Safety first, kids. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any official bang site, but I do have some leftover calcium carbide from my carbide lamp video. So instead of using the charger, I am simply going to drop those trunks straight into the combustion chamber. So as I said before, you would first unscrew this and pour water into the hole, which I have already done. I'm now going to drop a couple of chunks of calcium carbide into the sump. I'm going to close the breech, and all you do is push down on the spark plug to set off the cannon. Fire the hole! Ah, that was fun. Let's try that again. Woo! Whew, that was really fun. I can see why these things remained popular for so long. Now, as I mentioned before, in 1916, the Gas Cannon Company changed its name to the Toy Cannon Works. And again, in 1924, this was changed to the Conestoga Company, the name it retains to this day. Now, James Wiley remained in charge of the company until his retirement in 1955, while in the 1970s, the company was sold off to one Ercole Spinoza whose family continues to operate the company to this day. And indeed, other than a brief period during the Second World War, and again in 1952 when the Bethlehem factory burned down, Big Bang cannons have been in near-continuous production for nearly 120 years, a very impressive achievement for any toy. Now, as you can imagine, during that period, the Conestoga company produced a lot of different models of Big Bang cannon. Now, as I've said before, these videos are intended as technical overviews and not collector's guides. I can't go over every single little thing that the Conestoga company made, but I will try to hit some of the more important models. So as I mentioned before, the earliest Big Bang cannons to hit the market were actually made out of glass in order to demonstrate their inherent safety. Sold as the artillery game, these glass cannons were electrically ignited, just like William Franklin's original patented design, and could be fired on their own or used to launch a cork, ball, or other projectile. However, these didn't last very long, with only around 5,000 being produced before manufacturers shifted to full metal models. Now, in 1917, the now Toy Cannon Works introduced a line of five cast iron cannons, the 16F, the 11F, the 7F, the 11D, and the 7D. All had screw-in breech blocks with the spark wheel type igniters and differed mainly in size and carriage type, with the F models having wheeled field type carriages and the D models having fixed coastal defense style mounts. Uh, the D models also had separate ammunition chests for storing the calcium carbide, which apparently are quite rare to find, while in the F models this chest was integrated into the trail of the carriage. The 23-inch 16F is still manufactured by Conestoga to this day, being offered in painted cast aluminum and unpainted yellow and red brass. 
Now, the next significant model was the 10W speed. Introduced in 1923, it was the first Big Bang cannon to incorporate the new plunger-style spark plug and also featured an unusual four-wheeled carriage. The following year also saw the introduction of a very unusual product, the Big Bang gunboat. Now, while most Big Bang cannons took the shape of, well, cannons, the company did make a number of acetylene-powered toys shaped like other things. In the case of the gunboat, the blast was vented out of the Ford hosepipes. A similar product released in 1926 was the Big Bang Army Tank, which fit the cannon mechanism into a die-cast turret mounted on top of a wooden body with steel tracks. A higher quality version with a metal chassis and rubber wheels was introduced in 1941 as the 5TY Big Bang Motor Tank. Two versions of this model are still produced by Conestoga. In 1929, the now Conestoga company released one of its all-time most popular products, the Model 6F. Still produced to this day, around 5 million 6Fs have been manufactured since the 1930s. Also released in 1929 were the 11PR and the 11PY bombing planes, which, like the gunboat and army tank, were simply a regular Big Bang cannon mechanism with a different form. Tellingly, these were released just two years after Charles Lindbergh's famous solo flight across the Atlantic, so the styling is distinctly reminiscent of Lindbergh's aircraft, the Rhine M2-derived Spirit of St. Louis. In 1935, Conestoga introduced the 16-inch 10FC Junior Field and the 25-inch 15FC Major Field cannons, the first to feature the automatic band sight charger. In addition to the standard wheeled carriage models, a pedestal-mounted anti-aircraft version known as the 15AC was also produced. However, the base proved rather unstable, and this model was never very popular. Now, another unusual variant introduced around this time was the 8FR, or noise reduction model, which, as the name suggests, allowed the operator to adjust the intensity of the report, or the bang, produced by the cannon, ostensibly to comply with local noise ordinances. And there are actually two different versions of this. The first had a butterfly valve in the muzzle, whose angle could be set using a wing nut, varying the size of the aperture, while the second had fins inside the barrel and a plug which could be threaded into the muzzle in order to vary the size of the orifice. And this plug had a number of holes drilled in its face, hence why this model is typically known as the salt shaker variety. In 1958, Conestoga restyled many of its classic cannons to resemble more modern artillery, adding dummy hydraulic cylinders and rubber wheels, and painting the barrels all of drab. Thus, the 16F Siege Field Gun became the 16MM Siege Field Gun, the 6F Light Field Gun the 60MM Military Gun, the 10FC Junior Field Gun the 105MM Military Gun, and the 15FC Major Field Gun the 155MM Military Gun. Other acetylene-based products included the 1920s Big Bang Pistol, effectively a Big Bang cannon in handheld revolver form, and the 1936 G-Gun, a pump-action Big Bang rifle which was intended not only as a toy, but also for training hunting dogs for a fraction of the price of regular shot shells. And in addition to its Big Bang line of products, Conestoga also produced a number of regular toys, including a model roller coaster, a spinning top, and toy field glasses or binoculars. Now, as you can imagine, many other companies tried to cash in on the acetylene toy market by producing their own similar products. However, Conestoga, especially under James Wiley, was very aggressive in enforcing its patents and trademarks, and typically they ended up intimidating these other companies into selling their competing products to Conestoga. And some examples of these competing products include the Crasher Cannon, introduced in 1930, the Austin Magic Pistol, produced between 1945 and 1960, and the Smith's Welding Equipment Corporation Model 31 Big Shot and Model 32 Automatic Machine Gun. The latter two are particularly cool as they use an external gas generator connected to the gun by a hose and a sliding mechanism connected to the pistol grip that automatically meters in the gas mixture and expels the combustion products when the grip is cocked back and forth. And that is a brief technical and historical overview of the fascinating world of acetylene-powered toys, which I'm sure most of you had never heard of until now. I certainly hadn't until fairly recently. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another video or look at yet more fascinating bringbacks from my Washington, D.C. trip. Until then, I'm Jean Messier for Our Own Devices, and fire in the hole!